right, again, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon for uh, NCDEQ's per cop presentation. Uh, you know, it's five after the hour. I think we're about ready to begin as we had a few more attendees join. And um, today's presentation will start with Brian Phillips. So Brian, whenever you're ready, you can, uh, oh, there we go. See your, your video feed there. You can bring up those slides and, and we'll begin. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending our historically under-resourced county outreach program um, virtual meeting. And this is our second one. Uh, in addition to this, we also have our friends at EPA that will give us a small presentation on their school bus program before we start our presentation. So we have Alan Powell with EPA Region 4 here. He will begin to, um, in a few minutes and talk about their school bus program. Uh, just want to let everybody know that we are recording this webinar. Um, it will be available on the website and also uh, copies of the slides will be available for DAQ's presentation on the DAQ website and EPA is doing a modified version of the full presentation that's available on their website as well. And we can provide the link in the Q and A if anyone is interested. Alan, are you ready? I'm ready. Let me see. May not be able to get this video working, but I definitely can do the slides. Oh, okay. there we are. Awesome. Okay. Let me, uh, Pull up my slides, see if I can pull that screen up. All right. So everyone, you're, everyone seeing my slides? Yes. Oh, all right. Um, hey, well, thank you all. I wanted to um, uh, take a little bit of time and share uh, some information on a really uh, exciting program we've got with EPA. Um, it's our clean school bus program. Um, and the goal of the program back, back in, uh, 20, back uh, in October of last year, uh, President Biden signed the bipartisan infrastructure law. And one of the things it did was it said, hey, you, there's uh, $5 billion. And I said billion with a B, not I mean, more money than we've ever had for any of our programs at EPA that, uh, to deal with air things. Um, $5 billion to really um, change the uh, outlook for school buses in the country. And we we put that money into school buses and really um, looking at upgrading school buses to electric and alternative fuel vehicles, uh, electric and alternative fuel buses, with the goal of really um, making it uh, cost effective to completely switch from a diesel engine that's causing pollution not only localized to the ch for children but also for the air quality in the region and climate change. To a zero emission vehicle where there's uh, very limited zero emissions on the school bus itself and uh, varying limited emissions depending on how the electricity is. So we've got $5 billion and um, we're trying to, and we were charged with really trying to figure out how to spend it. And uh, there was some little bit of a guidance that we got with it. Um, half of it was strictly for electric vehicles. And the other half uh, was for alternative fuel vehicles and electric vehicles or zero emission vehicles, calling them. So if, if, if in the next five years there's something other than electric that is zero emission, it would qualify as well. So, you know, the timeline for this, what we're really looking at is um, we had 120 days from October to announce a program. And so, so uh, or to tell what we were doing. And we did that in March. And then um, uh, we're hoping to announce the actual program uh, in the next week or two here at, here at the end of May. And it's going to be a rebate program. In the short period of time that we had, we really didn't have a lot of um, options as far as how we, how we started kicking this program off. So uh, this first year that we're spending money, uh, it's going to be a rebate where uh, school systems purchase buses and they get re a rebate back and the money that's coming back to them for the rebate to help them assist them with the purchase is insane for a government program i'll go into that in just a little bit but i just wanted to kind of tell you you know our, our guidelines is is um we're hoping to really make selection may is may is the opening date of an application period and we'll do, have that open for about 90 days and then we'll close it and then we'll select just randomly draw um school system, school districts, and then tell them, hey, you, you've got the uh, limited amount of time to purchase buses, 
And once you purchase the buses, we're actually going to reimburse you before you get the buses and before you, before you have to pay for them. So that there's no out of pocket money from the school system. And we're hoping that uh, what that will do is help some of these eligible applicants, which are really our target um, areas and um, two critical ones that, that really we're really focused on is the state and local government school system, basically the school districts that uh, provide service and then also Indian tribes and tribal organizations. The two other other ones are nonprofit uh, transport school transportation associations and eligible contractors and uh, you know basically th this this is what that means schools school state and local government entities are pretty much schools what school districts and and uh, or organizations that manage the school bus fleets um, tribes uh, tribal organizations or tribal control controlled are Essentially, in North Carolina, it's only the federally tri federally recognized tribes, so it's only uh, the Eastern Band of the Cherokees. Um, nonprofits is uh, student transportation associations. There's a North Carolina pupil transportation association that might that's eligible. And then, from a contractor standpoint, uh, we're really looking at some of the vendors and the deal school bus dealers that. Um, are actually the ones that are selling and helping get the buses into the into the schools. They're eligible to be in the program and and get picked up and and then uh, help the school system get get school buses. So I'm going to skip that one. So one of the other things that we've done in the law is this is uh, we really tried to make sure that uh, we we look at uh, and prioritize areas where. They haven't had those opportunities before. You know, a lot of rural areas that um, really just because of the size of the size of the school district, that they're not competitive when they add, apply for grants and they apply for things. Um, and and also um, areas that have high poverty level. And what we're looking at is like a 20% children meeting 20% or greater poverty level under a certain standard that we have. And, uh, and that's quite a few school, sadly, that's quite a few school districts. So this is this is a little more details on that. Um, the small area income poverty estimates is what we're using, and that's from 2020 census information. It's, uh, and, um, and then rural school districts, the tribes. So what can you replace? Um, Pretty much any school bus that carries kids that's that's operating uh, minimum of three days a week uh, that's older than 2010 uh, can can be replaced. And the one thing that you have to do with that older school bus is you have to scrap it. So you do have to uh, render it inoperable where it can't be used again. It's a transportation vehicle, and and it also has to weigh at least 10,000 pounds. So. You really you're looking at um, real school buses, um, the bigger school buses, not not the smaller school buses. And you're looking at types. If if you if you know the types of school buses, it would be primarily type C and D buses that we are really uh, looking at. And it has to be in service at least three days a week uh, in the school year. So if if you know, there's some exceptions to that, if because of COVID, the school the school was not open for real in person classes. You know, obviously we're not going to count that as part of the three days per week. But during the weeks where um, you were in school, they the bus had to have been operated for three days a week. And and Brian, if you can tell me if I'm uh, getting close to time so that I can uh, make sure I don't uh, dilly dally too long on some of this stuff. Um, okay, you have about six more minutes left. Okay, great. Uh, so, so we're looking at uh, buses, and there's three types of buses: battery electrics, compressed natural gas, and propane. And uh, the critical for that is you can't can't have been already ordered. And the other thing is is that one of the requirements is is that they're in there for five years after after you use it. You got to keep them in service for five years. So, this is the thing I wanted to make sure I got to. And once I cover this, um, we I can I can kind of stop. Um, the, if you look at the amount of money that we're giving per school bus, this is this is uh, up to three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars 
for a class seven school bus. That's, that's those big school buses, uh, up to 285. We're basically paying for the whole school bus. And, and we're hoping that that, um, that, it's, that their school systems and school districts will see that and say, hey, let's figure out how we can, how we can do that, how we can make this work for electric school buses. Uh, for compressed natural gas and for propane, it's basically what we've done is uh, said, you know, we're gonna cover the cost differential between propane and compressed natural gas, but um, we really are really hoping that you'll consider electric and we're gonna make it worth your while to consider electric buses. So, and on top of um, school buses, one of the things with electric is, is that there's a different infrastructure set up. And, you know, you really don't think about fueling cars and buses, you know, there's some infrastructure for that, but with electric, you gotta think about it. And um, uh, so, so we're also allowing per bus, depending on whether you're in a prioritized area or a non-prioritized area, um, thirteen or twenty thousand dollars per bus to help pay for that infrastructure. And if you see that uh, red dotted line, that's what I'm talking about. Um, is uh, infrastructure was the electric panel, the charging station, and things like that on the right. To the left is what uh, we want our school districts, and we're encouraging y'all to take a look at is um, the get working with the utilities and the EMCs to make sure that you can you can get the power there in the in the um, amperage and the voltage that you need to uh, quickly charge school buses. So there's a it's going to be a pretty easy application process. It's online. Um, it's going to be online. And um, the the key thing, and this is this is the brick wall that if, if you're interested or, or you, a school district that you're working we work with is interested. Um, having an active SAM.gov account is, is imperative, and this is going to be the brick wall that keeps people from being eligible. Because if you don't have one, you can't apply. So um, that's the first thing that if if you're interested or your school districts are interested, to make sure that they have an active SAM.gov, and that the person whose email is the contact actually still works there, and uh, will be the one because they're the only ones that'll be able to have access to that stuff. That's that's critical. Um, I would certainly hate to have somebody not be able to apply because they, they waited till the last minute to do this because it can take some time. That's just, on the slide. You'll on, if you're interested, you can look in the slide and there's more information for that. So basically, just kind of summarize what I was saying. Uh, this year, we're only gonna we're gonna offer a half million, five hundred million instead of the billion, unless unless we just get a lot of people asking for more money, in which case we'll probably put more money into it. Um, but uh, the key thing is, you're gonna have ninety days to get an application in uh, to be part of that lottery. But there's a lot of work to be done between now and that ninety day deadline, and that is that you've really got to talk. If you're gonna do electric, you need to talk with your utilities and the EMCs and make sure they're your partner. Because the last thing we want is to pay for a lot of buses and then uh, then have be delivered and you try and school school districts trying to figure out how to um, uh, fuel their buses, how to charge them. So so anyway, again, we're, it's going to open in May, it closes in August, and I will uh, end it right there. So thank you, thank you for letting me um, giving me time here. Thank you, Alan. Uh, right now, if anyone has any questions for Alan, please uh, submit them through the Q and A section. We have one question right now, Brian, this is Robin. Um, and the question is from John Welch and it says, what would after school would after school programs qualify specifically such as boys and girls clubs? Well, that's, that's a, um, that's, that's a good question. I'll have to uh, look at that. I, it depends on how it's, is it depends on how the boys and schools girls uh, club is uh, written out, we're going to actually have a list of, uh, we're going to put a list of priority school districts. So uh, I can, I know it's not on a priority school district, um, but I'll tell you what, I will make sure, I don't think they're eligible, but I will check uh, with, uh, check and just confirm and make sure, and then I'll get back with Brian and Steve and make sure that y'all get that answer. I think we have a couple additional questions.
Let's see, this is from Kimberly Reeves. Hello, I am with the Boys and Girls Club. We serve seven counties in North Carolina. Five of those are very rural and in low poverty areas. Uh, we bus students every day from seven school systems to our facilities. As a nonprofit, do we qualify for this opportunity? Okay. All right. Well, let me. I, that's kind of like the question that was asked there before. I let me um, get back with you on that and see. Um, it, it, because of the way the way that you're set up, you may. But I, well, if I had to answer off the top, I would say no because you're not a school district. Um, but uh, there are some other eligible entities in, in providing services and school bus services is one of them. So it's kind of be a fit in there or not. So that would be um, what I I need to get some clarification on. This, and again, this is I apologize for not having that answer, but we're this thing is moving forward and we're making decisions as we go, and we'll we'll know exactly what the program is um, when we announce it. I mean, that's kind of how how this one's going. I really don't know all the absolute details of. of some of these things. Okay. And John Welsh had a follow up. He said they, they pick up school, um, students at schools and then transfer them to the clubs. Okay. Just a okay. clarification. All right. Well, um, I'll, I'll follow up with that. Okay. And we have another question from Richard. I will not try to say your last name, so I won't butcher it. I am from a nonprofit called Kids Dreams Club, and we bus children from schools five days a week. So I guess that's another question for eligibility. Yeah. Um, what I like, if, if it's okay with y'all, it's going to have to be because I'm, uh, I'll get those answers. Um, and, uh, if you can give me a little more details on, or, or send it to Brian and that a little more detail on exactly what your operational. In your relationship with the schools is, um, that will help me. But I think I, I know you're like a lot of the boys clubs that you pick people up and take them to your facilities for the after. It's like the after school programs. So. Uh, I just need to make, I need to clarify um, whether or not that's eligible or not. All right, I don't see any more questions. Um, so if we're receiving them more, we'll forward them to you, Alan. Okay. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Alan. All right. Let's see, Let's see if, if you can. All right. All right, so you should be seeing my screen now. Does everybody see my screen? We see it, Brad. Okay, okay. All right, uh, so we'll continue on to the second phase of this program is for the Volkswagen Settlement Phase 2, historically under Resource County Outreach Program. Uh, just a couple of things. Again, if you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A section, and we will be answering them at the end of the presentation. Um, and um, Melanie Henderson will lead us off. Uh, we have a whole program team here. We have uh, Melanie Henderson, we'll talk in a few minutes. We have Robin Barrels, who is our outreach coordinator. Uh, Sean Taylor, who is our public information officer for the division. Um, Dave Willis is our DC Fives program manager. Stephen Rice is our level two program manager. And Sheila Blanchard is a jack of all trades. She is our school bus program manager and currently our clean and heavy duty diesel program manager at the moment. Melanie, <clears throat> are you ready? Yes, Brian, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Um, as Brian said, um, we do have the Q&A box. So if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and enter those questions in the Q&A box and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Um, the raise hand feature will be disabled until the Q&A time and will only be considered for those who called into the webinar by phone. For those who called in, pressing star three will raise your hand and pressing star three again will lower your hand. Everybody else must use the Q&A box to submit the question. So what are we here to talk about today? Specifically, we are looking at the phase two historically under-resourced county outreach program. We're here to provide you some information about that program. Next slide, Brian. So what are you gonna expect today? We'll give you a quick overview of the Volkswagen settlement here in North Carolina, as well as a summary of our phase one awarded projects. We'll be taking a look at the various phase two programs, when and how you can submit your application, information on the RFPs that we do have out there. And then later on, my coworker Sheila will be talking about scoring criteria and eligibility. So we'll provide you information on that. Next slide. 
So what is the Volkswagen settlement? Basically, Volkswagen messed up. They got caught and it cost them a lot of money. North Carolina received $92 million. We were ninth in the country of these funds that Volkswagen had to pay for the emissions issues that they had. So here in North Carolina, like I said, we received $92 million. We spent one third of that, about one third in phase one, and then the remaining balance we're looking to distribute here in phase two. Next slide. So specifically, we want this $92 million to be spent across all 100 counties in North Carolina, not just the major cities. We have identified 37 specific counties across the state that have been seen as historically under-resourced. As you can see, we've got them from the mountains to the coast. Having this webinar today, we wanna to try to provide you the information, make sure the information gets to entities in these counties and allow you the opportunity to ask questions and get the information that we have. Because like I said, we wanna spend it all across the state, not just in a few cities. Next slide. So here's a photo of most of our Volkswagen settlement team from right to left. We have Sheila Blanchard, who is our school bus program manager. Next to her is Dave Willis. He is our DC Fast program manager. Brian Phillips, he runs the Volkswagen Settlement Program. Myself, Melanie Henderson, I am over the Transit and Shuttle Bus Program. Steve Hall is over all of us, that's Brian's boss. And then on the end, with the little bit of hair, is Stephen Rice, he is our Level 2 Program Manager. So, next slide. So during phase one, we awarded just over 26 million total in projects. This included funding towards 172 vehicles and 109 charging stations across the state. The majority of the vehicles went to the school bus program as 40% was allocated to that program with 111 new school buses across the state of North Carolina. Next slide. We do have several completed projects from phase one. Information on each of the completed projects can be found on our website under success stories. All of the categories that we have, um, except for the transit and shuttle bus program, do have completed projects from phase one. Next slide. So what about phase two? We combined what we originally planned for phase two and phase three into one program and have a total of just under $68 million for distribution in phase two. As with phase one, 40% has been allocated towards the school bus program and 20% each to the transit and shuttle bus replacement program and the clean heavy duty equipment and vehicle programs. There will be priority given to electric vehicle replacements in each of these programs, but we will be considering all fuel types. The ZEV infrastructure programs, which includes the DC FAST and Level 2, have been broken up into different RFPs, and we have allocated the maximum allowed of 15% to these programs. Next slide. You're gonna see this slide a few times today. Um, if you are not on our mailing list, please, please, please sign up for our mailing list. This is how we get information distributed. With all of the active programs going on right now, we are sending emails out weekly, um, if not a couple of times a week, because we do have RFPs that have started closing more RFPs that are opening. So this is the best way to get information on RFPs, upcoming webinars, whatnot, is through our mailing list. So please do sign up. Next slide. So what is eligible under the Volkswagen Settlement Program? Clean, heavy duty, large diesel vehicles, including school bus, transit and shuttle bus, as well as your many street vehicles, such as um, yard waste trucks, trash trucks, large heavy duty dump trucks. These are eligible vehicles under the Volkswagen Settlement Program. 
Next slide. We also have our ZEV infrastructure. This includes the level two as well as DC fast programs. It is charging infrastructure for light duty zero emission vehicles only. Next slide. As part of our clean heavy duty diesel vehicle and equipment program, we also have the Diesel Emission Reduction Act or DERA option. This includes several pieces of equipment as well as heavy um, the vehicles. So, but there are some additional vehicles and equipment that may be eligible under the DERA option. Next slide. Some of the equipment that is eligible are freight switchers, locomotive or locomotive switchers, um, tugboats and ferries, shoreline equipment, airport equipment, forklifts, specifically for the Volkswagen settlement program, forklifts have to have a lift capacity of 8,000 pounds or greater. And that is a Volkswagen settlement requirement for forklifts, a lift capacity of 8,000 pounds or greater. Next slide. So we do have several RFPs going on here in phase two. We have a total of nine, many of which have already been released. Group one, we released transit bus, the DC fast infrastructure program priority corridors, as well as the level two state agency. Under group two, we released our school bus program, RFP, as well as the level two publicly accessible RFP. In group three, two of the four have already been released, the DC fast exi existing site capacity increases, as well as the level two multi-unit dwelling. We have two remaining, the clean heavy duty equipment vehicle replacement program that's gonna come out later this month, as well as the level two workplace for non-state government agencies will come out sometime in June. Next. So who's eligible under phase two? Any project submitted by local, state, or tribal organizations, public or private nonprofit organizations, or projects submitted by public private partnership where the lead agency is that public entity or the nonprofit en entity. In addition to these, for our ZEV infrastructure programs, the level two and the DC FAST, public and private applicants are also eligible. Basically, everybody but individuals are eligible for the ZEV infrastructure programs. <clears throat> so, what are the eight steps to apply for funding? The first step, if you are interested in applying for funding, is to get an NCID. That is the very first step in the process. I will tell you that can take a few days just to get an NCID. So if you are interested in applying, go ahead and sign up as an individual and get an NCID. The next step <clears throat> is once you have your NCID, you wanna request access to the grant management system. In order to get access to the grant management system, you're gonna need three things. You're gonna need an NCID, you're gonna need to complete an access authorization form, which is online, and you're also gonna need to complete a substitute North Carolina substitute W-9 form. This needs to be the North Carolina form and not the federal form. So you're gonna need all three of those things to get access to our grant management system. If you could hit, thank you. <clears throat> Once you have access to our grant management system, you're gonna to wanna to get together all of the information you're gonna to need to put into that application. Get the information about old vehicle and equipment, get vendor quotes, letters of support. We have several checklists available on our website to help you see what information you are going to need. As I said, with each of our RFPs, we're having two webinars. Each one we are holding a grant management system information webinar, as well as a specific RFP webinars. For those that we've already held, recordings and the presentation are available online on our website. This is one of the pieces of information we send out in our weekly email to our mailing list. So you've got your information together, you've got access to the grant management system, apply. 
like I said, our RFPs are opening and closing. We've already had one RFP close. We've got another one closing next week. We've got non RFPs total. <clears throat> Filled out that application. You want to submit it. Once you submit that application, um, you're not going to be able to change it. All of our RFPs are open for 90 days. Once the deadline hits for any of our RFPs, there are no extensions. So you need to apply by the deadline. <clears throat> so you want to, once you've submitted, once the RFP deadline is hit, you want to check the status. You may or may not hear from us. Our review process is going to take a couple of months. So <clears throat> you may not hear for us from quite a while. If you have a question at any point, you can contact any of us. You can go ahead and click enter again. And honestly, if you have a question, comment, whatever, at any point, contact any member of the team. We're here to help. We want you to get the information. We want you to get your questions answered. If you have a question about ZEV infrastructure, you're welcome to talk to those program managers or any of us equipment or vehicle and equipment program managers. If we don't know it, we'll get you to the right person. I will tell you overall, getting access to the grant management system from requesting an NCID and submitting the access authorization and substitute W-9 form, that process has been taking a while. Um, it has been taking seven to 10 days lately, and that's assuming that all of your information is correct the first time. So if you are interested in applying for any of our programs, you have to have access to the grant management system and you need to go ahead and get that access, begin that process. Like I said, it's taking more and more time and we're looking at seven to 10 days. You don't wanna wait until the last minute or the last week before an RFP application is due because you may not get access. Second time, if you are not on our mailing list, please sign up to our mailing list. Here's the email address and just put the word subscribe in the subject line. That is how easy it is. <clears throat> so transit and shuttle bus program. These include class four through eight transit and shuttle bus programs used for transporting people around everyone except students to and from school and school related activities. The transit and shuttle bus program was our first RFP to be released. It was released on February 1st. It's actually already closed. It closed last week on May 2nd. So if you have a transit or shuttle bus, that you are interested in applying, it is, I hate to tell you, but it is too late to apply for that program. It did close. Um, we are currently reviewing the applications and I'm spending a lot of time as the transit and shuttle bus program manager doing that. Um, next, I'm gonna turn this over to Dave Willis, who is our DC FAST program manager. Dave. Hi, um, my name again is Dave Willis. Um, if you don't know me, um, my contact information will be at the end um, of this presentation. Brian, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, for actually, the first thing I was supposed to do was give you a definition. Okay, so for DC Fast, um, DC Fast sites are, um, Brian, if you could back up just one, please. Sorry. Um, these are the higher kilowatt kilowatt rated sites. Um, they start at 50 kilowatts and go up to right now um, up to 400 kilowatts. Um, there are a few that say they go higher than that, but um, for practical purposes in North Carolina, um, 50 to 200 kilowatts is about the majority of what we'll see. There are some out there in the ground that are um, 300. All Three of these pictures um, picture a uh, 62 and a half kilowatt charger. Um, the difference between a DC fast and a level two, a level two charger, the kilowatts are much smaller. They run off basically a 60 amp service, the same as your dryer in your home. They're anywhere from around seven kilowatts to usually 14.4 um, kilowatts. Um, it's a slower charge um, DC fast as the name implies, is supposed to be a fast charge, um, usually getting you back to 80% in less than 30 minutes. Um, next slide now. 
please, Brian. Thank you. Okay, so for funding um, for the DC Fast Priority Corridor, which is the one that actually closes on May 16th, which um, if you haven't started your process to applying, you need to do that today. Um, as Melanie said, it does take several days to get into the grant management system. Um, and that is really outside of our control. We have um, just under uh, $5 million for priority corridors. That is a um, segments of highway that um, have been determined to have gaps that needed to be filled. For our existing site RFP that's out now is just over $2 million. Um, that's still have a good bit of time to apply for that. If you have a site as um, DC fast infrastructure already installed, it doesn't have to be working. You just have to have existing have had DC fast there before. So it has to have been a minimum of 50 kilowatts. Um, so you have some of the infrastructure hurdles um, already tackled to either expand or replace faulty equipment at um, those existing sites. Um, and that closes July 11th. Next slide. Okay, so this is the map of the priority corridors. It's a little bit hard to see. The best way to figure out whether you're on or off the priority corridors, this is just a representation. The, the segments of these highways are listed very clearly in the RFP. If you still have questions, give me a call. I'll be glad to help you um, determine whether you're on the priority corridor or not. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Brian. So the first RFP, is for the priority corridors. That application window is coming very, very soon, May 16th um, in um, five days. So you need to hopefully have those applications submitted very soon. Um, my second RFP, the existing sites, um, again, that goes through July 11th and just a shout out, if you don't think that you're on a priority corridor, please still apply. Um, we will be awarding as we go through the funds. Not everybody's going to be on a priority corridor. We understand that. We're um, still going to um, score all the projects. However, the score ranks out. Those are the projects that are going to um, be awarded. I and mean, it's the same thing for the existing sites. Not all the existing sites are going to be on priority corridors. That's they're going to score better if they're off a priority corridor. But those existing sites, um, there's some out there that aren't on priority corridors, and we're looking to replace that infrastructure as well. Next slide. And I think it's just going to. Um, so if you're not on the priority corridor, um, you can go ahead and go to the next one again apply. So um, the way both of these programs are laid out, we'll talk about the DC fast first, the um, priority quarter first. The lower your kilowatt rating, the less funding per port will you'll have in this chart. It goes through through that. If you're a government owned property you and you're on the priority quarter, you would get the uh, if you're a 50 to 60 kilowatt, you get 67 and a half. If you're 60 to 75 kilowatts, you get seven seventy six thousand per port with a maximum of four ports. Um, that's, I mean, if you have trouble with the chart, um, it does get a little bit compu confusing whether you're government or not, non government. But for the first two levels, there's a four port um, maximum. And if as the port, the kilowatts is larger, there is a two port. Um, maximum that we would be able to refund. Next slide. And for the exist, existing sites, it's pretty much the same. If it's a government owned prop um, property, that's the 100% um, funding level max that we would have, and then 80% for the non-government. And again, it still follows the, the four port and two port maximum, depending on your, um, your charging rate. Next slide. And I'm going to hand this over to Stephen, and he can talk about the level two infrastructure program. All right, thanks, Dave. 
Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're doing well and ready to learn about the Fold Swag at Level 2 Infrastructure Program. Uh, most of my presentation will focus on the three sub-programs that are currently active, but uh, I'll start with some general Level 2 information that applies uh, to everyone with Level 2 charging projects. Uh, don't think I need to spend a lot of time talking about the difference between DC Fast and Level 2 because Dave did a really good job of that when he began his presentation. Um, but again, for anyone that does have a question about the differences between those two charging types, uh, the Level 2 program uh, provides chargers that are really designed for uh, extended time charging. You, you're going to be at one place or your vehicle will be at one place for uh, an hour or two, uh, getting a slower charge uh, over a longer period of time. Um, and again, some of that information will be covered as we continue in the presentation. All right, Brian, next slide. So here's a table with some basic information on all of the phase two level two programs. Looking at the first row um, for the state agency program, the biggest takeaways are that this is a competitive application program and that the application is currently open in the grants management system but closes on May 31st. Beneath that row is information on the public access and the multi-unit dwelling programs. Uh, notice that they are first come first serve award types and that the application for public access is open and that the uh, application for MUD is open. Or I'm sorry, the RFP was released, was released for the MUD, but the, the application, the ability to apply for the MUD program will uh, be active on June 13th. My apologies for that. Um, these are the three sub programs that have their RFPs released and uh, the workplace program is planning its release later in June. So if you're interested in any of these programs, uh, please do not wait to gain access to the grants management system or to apply for any of the open applications. Next slide. So like all Volkswagen programs, there are a number of project and site requirements that should be considered before you apply for funding in any of the level two categories. For example, each project must have a minimum of two ports and chargers must be maintained and operated for a minimum of five years from the date of the project's completion. A uh, full list of project requirements is found in each respective Level 2 program's RFP. Next slide. So now I will focus on the active Level 2 program, starting with state agencies. The first question you have is who is eligible to apply for state agency program funding? Well, in short, this program is designed for and limited to North Carolina state government agencies and state maintained attractions. Uh, government is defined in the RFP as a North Carolina state government agency, institution, or attraction supported by state funds. Please note that the state agencies are subject to using contractors approved on the Department of Administration's statewide term contract 691A for electric vehicle charging station infrastructure. Next slide, please. The state agency's RFP identifies four locations that are eligible for level two ZEV charging infrastructure funding. These are government owned property, government leased property, state parks, plus state museums and other state maintained attractions. If the government property is leased, it must have at least five years remaining on that lease from the date of project contract execution, and the property site owner must provide approval for the project. Next slide. Uh, the type of access and the type of charger used in a project will determine the maximum percentage of total project cost reimbursement. If a project offers public access and network chargers, it can be reimbursed up to 100%. If a project offers public access but uses non-network chargers, it can be reimbursed up to 80%. And if a project is not publicly accessible and uses non-network chargers, it can be reimbursed up to 60%. Multiple project types cannot be incorporated into a single application uh, and that uh, and uh, public access chargers must be accessible during site or attraction business hours to the general public without any type of restriction. So if you're applying for a public access project, uh, you must attest to these um, 
requirements in the project details of your application or provide proof of the accessibility. Next slide. All right, uh, let's shift gears and talk about the level two public access program. In phase one, publicly accessible projects were eligible for funding, but did not have their own unique program. Out of the 79 agreements for level two projects in phase one, 70 had the designation of publicly accessible. So after seeing the desire that applicants had to provide this type of charging, we decided to make a uh, point of emphasis in phase two. Next slide. Uh, in this program, applicants are limited to $25,000 in approved rebate vouchers at any time, and all chargers must be networked. Something new in phase two is that rebate vouchers for awarded projects will expire after one year from the date of an agreement being fully executed. Uh, the pandemic and supply chain issues made the original phase one timeframe of uh, 180 days borderline impossible for most awardees. So we decided to learn from that experience and double the time in phase two. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so again, we might be asking who is eligible to apply for public access program funding. The general list from the RFP is found on this slide. And as long as you are not applying on behalf of yourself as an individual, considered a North Carolina state agency, or providing charging for workplace or multi-unit dwelling purposes, you should be uh, considered an eligible applicant. Specific details on applicant eligibility and the requirements are found in the level two public access RF RFP. Next slide, please. Uh, so the type of property a project is on will determine the maximum percentage of total project costs reimbursement. If a project is on government owned property and offers public access, it can be reimbursed at $5,000 per port or up to 100% of the project costs, whichever is less. Uh, or if a project is on non government owned property and offers public access, it can be reimbursed at $4,000 per port or up to 80%, again, whichever is less. Uh, so, for example, let's say a project was to be on non-government owned property and consists of installing four level two chargers. Uh, if all the quotes for the project totaled to $22,000 and the um, two the calculated rebate options uh, would then be $16,000 or $17,600. So since the project, uh, since the program uses the lesser of the two calculations, the maximum rebate offered would be the $16,000 option for the project. Now, please be aware that multiple project types cannot be incorporated into a single application. Um, oh, and we skipped ahead, but that's that's fine. We can talk about site requirements. Um, all public access site requirements from phase one have covered uh, carried over to phase two. Uh, but there are a few requirements that are new in phase two. I mentioned a few times that sites must be available for use by the public for an annual average of 12 hours per day without access restrictions. Uh, two repeat requirements are that if the project property is not owned by the applicant, the rebate applicant must provide a signed letter from the landowner indicating approval of the project and that projects uh, must include at least one designated and clearly marked EV parking space per port. Uh, the full list of site requirements for the program are outlined in the RFP. Uh, and then finally, let's talk about the multi-unit dwelling program, which was just released uh, this Monday. Uh, the funding options are differentiated between public accessibility, where having public accessibility will provide a maximum per port rebate of $4,000 or up to 80% of total project costs. Uh, and not having the public accessibility will provide a maximum per port rebate of $3,000 or up to 60% of total project costs. Next slide, please. Uh, so as you may have guessed from a multi-unit dwelling program, eligible applicants include property owners of multi-unit dwellings in North Carolina, such as apartment complexes and condominiums. Uh, please note that individually owned townhouses, row houses, or mobile homes are excluded from eligibility and that specific uh, details can be found in the RFP. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the set requirements for this program are similar in nature to the other level two programs where publicly accessible sites must be available for use by the public for an annual average of 12 hours a day without restriction. The rebate applicant must provide a signed letter from the landowner uh, or the HOA indicating approval of the project um, if the property is not owned by the applicant and uh, projects must include at least one designated and clearly marked EV parking space per port. Uh, and again, the full list of requirements uh, for a site is found in the RFP and uh, that covers the three sub programs that are active right now that have their RFPs released and uh, we'll transition now to uh, Sheila as she gives information on the bus program. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to assume that's a yes. <laughs> we hear you, Sheila. Okay, I'm going to talk about the school bus program, um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how to create a competitive and eligible application for all of the programs. So, first off, the school bus program, we are replacing daily yellow school buses as well as the white activity buses that um, LEA's local education agent or local education agencies and schools have on hand and in their in their fleets. Next slide, please. For the school bus program, school buses are specifically defined. They are buses that transport students to and from school and school related activities. So these include the yellow daily buses um, and these also include the white activity buses that um, are owned by the LEA or the school, the eligible school, um, that go to events that are organized and operated by eligible schools or LEAs. So these eligible buses, the buses that can be replaced include the 2009 engine model year and older class four through eight school buses. They, they may be replaced with new diesel or alternative fueled or an all electric bus. Um, and all these replacements must be an engine, engine model year of the award. So this coming year or next year or the year before. So you've got a few years there. Replaced buses must be scrapped and scrapped is a specific definition um, by the EPA. The scrappage is technically it means to render inoperable and available for recycle and at a min minimum to specifically cut a three inch hole in the engine block for all engines. We ask for pictures of the before engine and the after engine um, in order to to make sure that the engine that has been has been replaced or has been asked to be replaced is indeed taken off the road at all costs. Um, finally, we also ask that the chassis is cut in half. Um, this is a disabling um, of the chassis and you cut those, the, you cut the frame well, rails completely in half. And I would recommend that when you do this, you take it to the place where you plan on scrapping the vehicle because once you cut those frame rails in half, you will not be able to transport that vehicle anywhere. So we ask for these and we ask for proof of these things um, as part of getting your reimbursement. Now remember, this is a reimbursement program. This means that you will apply for the grant You and if you get the grant, you will have to buy the vehicles and then um, request reimbursement from us after you provide all of this evidence of scrappage. And um, so that is, that's something to remember that this is a reimbursement process. Next slide, please. Um, for the school bus RFP in particular, there's 27.1 million available for phase two. This is the rest of the funds that will be available for the school bus um, program. Uh, like our other programs, the eligible model years are 2009 and older, and this will be true for really all of the vehicle replacement programs that are under the VW program. <clears throat> like our other programs, government entities are eligible for 100% of reimbursement for all three fuels. So that includes diesel, alternative fuel, and all electric. And for all electric, this also includes the associated uh, infrastructure that goes with um with running an all electric uh, school bus. Non governments, which include um, uh, non profits and not for profits, um, 
uh, are eligible for 25% of reimbursement of a diesel bus, 25% of an alternative fueled bus, so this includes propane, and 75% of an all electric bus to replace uh, these, these 2009s and older scrapped buses. So for this program, 50% of our funds are going to be prioritized for electrification projects. And like I said, this includes um, the associated infrastructure. It's one, one bus, one uh, charger is, is how that um, comes out. So we will fund one charger for each electric bus that you have in your application. Next slide, please. The timeline, we released the RFP on March 7th. Um, the applications are open now. If you want to apply, uh, I you should have already asked for access and have an NCID, but if not, um, you should probably do that as soon as possible if you'd like to uh, apply to this program. The applications are due June 6th. We will not accept late or incomplete applications after uh, 1159 of that date, um, of the time of that date. So please get your applications in on time. We will be uh, evaluating applications, and this means scoring the applications, scoring the vehicles, and then sending those vehicles to selection committee in July and August, and then hopefully awarding and announcing our awards in uh, late summer, July and August 2022. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to submit an eligible and competitive application. Eligible is, is easy enough. It means being the right entity that can submit to the right RFP under the right application and at the right cost share. So eligibility is something that you have to read an RFP to determine whether or not your project and you as an entity are eligible to submit a project and what the guidelines of those projects are. Competitive, however, um, which most of our programs, with the exception of the first come first serve level two programs, are competitive applications. That is that is dependent upon um, the rest of the of the application pool and how you stack up against the vehicles that are submitted by the rest of the applications. Next slide, please. Once again, as far as who can submit a project, for most of the programs, it's it's very specifically defined in the RFP. Those funding levels and project types vary by what kind of entity you are, whether you're government or non-government, or whether um, you're private for some of the DC FAST stuff. Um, so you're going to want to read that closely. Um, as far as the vehicle replacement program, there are different uh, requirements also for those model years, um, the ones that you would want to replace the mileage and cost shares. Um, so review the RFP to make sure that your your in, you as an entity are eligible and your project is eligible. Once again, no individuals are eligible for funding under any VW program. Next slide, please. Um, if you need some help in determining whether you are eligible or if your project is eligible, I urge you to visit the NCVW eligibility tool um, that we built. It is essentially a series of questions to guide you to the correct RFP that you can apply under. Um, it, it asks you uh, where, you know, to, to select choices based on who you are and your affiliation, and then what kinds of vehicles you may want to replace or where you would like your level to, who would you like your level to charger to serve, and it should direct you to the right RFP to apply under. Um, so hopefully this will help you if you're trying to figure out what whether your project, your vehicle is better for a DIRA project or if your project is better for um, a VW heavy duty project or a school bus project, it should help you get to the right RFP. So um, there will be a link to this at the end of this presentation. Actually, everything that we have linked will be at the end of this presentation. So feel free to look for that um, and visit that if you have some questions about your eligibility. Next slide, please. Just a quick overview of the criteria. This is a competitive program for most of the programs, with the exception of the first come, first serve level two uh, RFPs. Um, the, the things, because the 
VW mitigation fund was created because of the extraneous NOx that was created, that was put into the atmosphere by offending Volkswagen vehicles. NOx mitigation is the primary goal of all of these programs, of all of these grant programs. Therefore, NOx mitigation and NOx emissions reductions through the replacement of old uh, emissions high vehicles is the primary goal of all of our replacement programs. That is why so much of the points are going towards the NOx emissions reductions for each vehicle and the cost effectiveness of NOx for all these vehicles as well. So 60 of the points go into um, into the ranking of these of, of all of these vehicles or all of these projects that can be submitted. Cost effectiveness is affected by the cost of the vehicle, how much your project costs to replace, and then how uh, how much NOx the replaced vehicle produces or would have produced in its lifetime. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the in the subsequent slides. Um, vehicle electrification projects get a 10 point uh, extra bonus points, and this is to make them more competitive against conventional replacement projects. Um, this, uh, while the points themselves may not be how the selection committee determines selection, um, they will be, we will, we will um, add these points up. We will rank all the vehicles by the best scoring to the least scoring or the best DC fast to the least least scoring DC fast. We will send them to the selection committee and we will ask them to choose. So the higher your points, the better your chance of getting selected. Additionally, if your vehicle uh, is in a uh, does a duty cycle that is in a historically under resourced county, and we have some maps that tell you which of those counties are. Additionally, it's in each RFP. Then you will get ten bonus points for each of the vehicles that do their duty cycles in those um, in those counties. Next slide, please. This is actually what you will see in the RFP. It tells you how we calculate the NOx, how we calculate the lifetime NOx, um, where uh, you know where these points are coming from. And so this this is just to give you an idea of what you see in the RFP and and how these values are calculated for your project. Next slide, please. So how can you increase that score? I'm sure that's what you're all asking to yourself. This is a screenshot of the actual, um, this is gonna be specifically for vehicles and for vehicle replacement. So this will not just be true of school buses. This will also be true of the clean heavy duty um, RFP that will be released later. Um, you will be filling out all of this information in a spreadsheet for each of your units or each of your vehicles that you would like to replace. The, the table on the left is the unit that you would like to replace. And that's that you, we want us to give you, you want, we want you to give us everything that you know about that vehicle. It's primary use, it's make, it's model, it's year. Um, we want to know how many miles it gets. It's annual, uh, annual idling hours. Um, and all of that will help us put it into the diesel emissions quantifier, which is a tool uh, that EPA has on their website to quantify emissions from vehicles. So we ask that you fill out that for your replaced vehicle. And then the, the table on the right is the, is the replacement that you would like for that vehicle. So this is going to be the new vehicle, the new make, the new model. Um, and then what's most important here is the, is the funds that you were requesting um, and how much it's going to, how many VW dollars it's gonna cost for us to fund your replacement project. Next slide, please. The things that most affect these scores are going to be the following. Engine model year. Um, the model year determines the tier that an engine has been manufactured and the, um, manufactured to as far as the EPA requirements of emission standards. This means that lower tiers have fewer emissions um, mitigation things on them, so they tend to have higher emissions. Higher tiers like tier four, which is where we are now for most heavy duty equipment, are more clean. They have much less of an emissions uh, emissions blueprint or footprint, pardon me. And what we're asking for is not necessarily the engine body year, but what we want is that 
engineer. So if, on the left here is a Thomas bus. You can see that it's been manufactured in 1997. Um, but if you look at the engine tag of that same bus, that is actually a 1996 engine. The 1996 engine is, is a different tier than a 1997 engine. It's a lower tier, which means it's going to have more emissions, which are, which are the things that are, that are going to affect that NOx emission score. Um, so a general rule of thumb is that the older the engine, the more emissions that engine will produce. Next slide, please. Annual mileage. So annual mileage, obviously, with the combustion of fuel, you will have more emissions. Emissions, once again, are what we're measuring to get those scores. So when we ask for those odometer reading, we're going to ask for the annual mileage that you put on those vehicles every year. You're welcome to use an average of the last three years. We understand COVID has, has, um, has, has had an effect on some of those annual mileage, especially if you keep track of those things for your fuel use. Um, you're welcome to use an average for those vehicles. But what we're really looking for is a, is a true representation of the miles that that vehicle will get on it on a year so we can accurately um, quantify the emissions that benefits that we'll get from taking that vehicle off of the road. Um, you can take the odometer reading and the vehicle age to get an annual miles. Um, that's acceptable too. In general, the general rule is the higher the annual miles on a vehicle, the more emissions. So the workhorses, the vehicles that get all the miles in your fleets, um, the ones that are a little bit older, those are really the ones that you may want to target to apply in this program. Next slide, please. The final, one of the more important things because we're doing um, a lifetime emissions, we are also looking for remaining life. Remaining life is the expected life of that vehicle that you want to, that you want to replace the old vehicle. How many years you expect that to be getting the annual mileage that you have submitted on that spreadsheet? In general, older vehicles will have fewer years of remaining life. However, older vehicles with lower mileage may have more years of remaining life. You can uh, calculate this based on the expected lifetime of a vehicle. Sometimes vehicle manufacturers will give you what an engine can um, expect. Um, because this is important because we take the annual emissions produced by those annual mileage and the tier of your engine, and we calculate lifetime emissions by multiplying it by uh, that remaining life, because that will give us how many emissions we can take off the road by the removal of that vehicle and replacing it with a cleaner, newer, less, uh, less intensive emissions vehicle. Next slide, please. And one thing to say, uh, you are we do you are determining uh, that annual life or that life or the lifetime what's left of the vehicle. But something that's out of range will flag that, and we will use the default um, that we have in our. Uh, in I've developed a table of defaults for um, for us for vehicles. Um, if if that makes more sense, this is a small infographic I made to show how a 2006 and a 1996, these buses that have these profiles can both be very competitive in this program. You may assume that an older vehicle um, may be have a higher emissions footprint and that may be the best one that you want to submit, but that may not always be true. You may have, uh, so the 1996, while you can tell from the smoke in the back, it has a larger emissions. Every mile that that engine gets on the road is putting out more emissions. But if it if it's doing less annual miles, that emissions lifetime emissions is going to be about the same. And then when you multiply it by the remaining life, once again we see that a low a 1996 with a high initial emissions uh, footprint that only gets 6,000 miles a year, but is still regularly maintained has a lot of remaining life. And I know some of you activity bus folks out here have some of these buses like this. Um, you can still have a fairly high lifetime emissions footprint, which would make you competitive on the far column. This, this is an idea of what would be the most competitive project. So the yes means it's competitive against others like it. The dollar signs are how much money you may have to put 
in order to make, and what I mean by money you have to put in, this is a cost share, a voluntary cost share that you would have to put in to make that vehicle more competitive against like vehicles. Similarly, you can see the 2006 up top has a smaller emissions uh, footprint, um, but with the remaining life, if it's, if it's well maintained and it's getting a ton of mileage, that is gonna be one of our most competitive um, targeted vehicles. Those are the ones that are gonna float to the top in our scoring criteria. And one thing I need to add about the school bus program, you are welcome to as a LEA or as a, um, a school or a charter charter school, you're welcome to apply on your own behalf for uh, replacement of buses in your fleet. This can include the daily buses or the activity buses. Those you can apply directly to the GMS under your organization. Additionally, for the daily buses that DPI um, provides, you're welcome to contact Kevin Harrison, who's the transportation authority there, um, in order to get on an application that he is submitting um, for the replacement of those uh, buses that they buy for the LEAs. Next slide, please. Um, finally, uh, we will have a clean heavy duty RFE that comes out later, which um, may address some of the non road equipment that's out there, which include forklifts and um, and uh, other kind of locomotives, things like that. So instead of looking at the mileage, instead we look at the hours um, and everything else uh, is about the same, but then we also take into consideration horsepower. So when you are submitting those applications, there's a second page on the spreadsheet that you would fill out for those kinds of projects. Next slide, please. <clears throat> This is the project selection criteria for the DC FAST. DC FAST um, is a little bit different in that there's no replacement um, that's happening. We're not, we're not mitigating NOx through the replacement of a, of a non-working DC FAST. But what we're doing is we're looking at the cost effectiveness of the DC FAST station to build the station. So the really one of the only ways that you can increase your score, all things being the same, if you have a site chosen and if you have the um, the license to build on that site, so to say, uh, is going to be cost shares, how much money you put into that project. And just for reference, um, the cost shares in phase one, the mean cost share for the awarded projects was about 25%. And uh, and um, Dave can correct me on this, but I would suspect that the ones that were not awarded had far uh, less of a cost share that was put forth by um, the the folks that that submitted those projects. So cost shares are really going to help you for these DC fast projects. Next slide, please. And this is the actual uh, criteria from the RFP. If you're interested in seeing exactly how these scores are calculated. Next slide, please. Some things to consider. Once again, uh, visit the VW eligibility tool. Um, like all, all of the grant programs, uh, with the exception of the some of the level two projects, voluntary cost shares will make your project more competitive. All things being the same, if a bus fleet, a one bus from from this side of the state applies against another bus from this side of the state, all things being the same. The, the organization that puts 10% or 5% on that bus, that one is gonna be more competitive than the other. Please start your process early. If you haven't already um, applied, uh, gotten an NCID and applied uh, to uh, be added into our GMS, I would recommend you do that as soon as you may if you know that you're going to submit an application. Please read the RFP carefully. Make sure you're you're eligible. Additionally, our, we tried to make the application accessible and easy, but there are some short answers. And these are answers, these are places where you tell us why we should fund you. What is it that distinguishes your project from every other project that, that we are getting? Are there any uh, substantially um, special populations that you serve with your um, with your service. Are there other considerations about where your um, about your location that may not necessarily be that we may not be able to see from the regular application? So, when we are looking to um, tie break 
or if if there if someone's on the fence about whether or not to be funded, it is those fields often that come into play. So I would recommend you make sure that you fill in all of those short answers that I think there are, are five and maybe one that you that is is um, that you may or may not fill out. Um, so please please put uh, any additional information that you think we may need to make our decisions or for our selection committee to make their decisions. Finally, incomplete applications will not be considered and a complete application at the vehicle level includes a vehicle spreadsheet with all of the information that was in the previous slide. It also includes a fully filled out application in the GMS and it includes being submitted and signed and verified in the GMS. For DCFAS, those, the, the other things you need, the site agreement, all those things have to also be in those applications. There are checklists on the websites and uh, for each of these RFPs about what you need to have a complete application. If you do not have a complete application, we will not consider it after the RFP closes. Finally, electric projects are prioritized, but all fuels will be considered. We look to replace all kinds of vehicles with all kinds of vehicles. So um, if you're not interested in electric projects, that's okay. Um, please uh, submit uh, if you want, if you like to do a diesel to, for diesel or um, some other alternative fuel project, we will, those will be funded as well. We are here to help. Um, we're putting a face uh, the reason we're going out into these historically under-resourced counties is to put a face to what we're doing here to get the word out so you see that we're people you can call up if you need help and we're we're absolutely um here uh to help you so please don't hesitate to contact if you us if you have any additional questions after this and finally if you wait until the last day to submit your application, you may not be able to submit an application or you may not be able to submit the best application. Please contact us way before you want to submit or um, finish your application because we're not going to be able to give you the quality of help that you may need if you wait until the day before an RFP closes. And, um, you know, just I would I would get it in early and then we take a look and if you're missing anything we have the opportunity to get back to you and be like hey you you left out the spreadsheet or you left out this in your information and it gives you a much better chance of getting awarded so please um please try and and do your good homework and get it get it submitted uh as early as you can next slide please here are the contacts that we've been talking about we got brian and sean and robin we're all here on the call today um, these are the specific program contacts for each of the programs uh, that we've been talking about, um, infrastructure as well as the vehicle replacement programs. Um, and then the final slide, we have the useful links. So once you download this presentation and you open it in uh, presentation mode, you can go to all of the links that are linked here today. And we try to really, really link you to anything that you might have a question about, which includes the outreach website that brought you here today, our GMS uh, information system, um, any of the, the eligibility and the emissions quantifier, any of the forms you might need to apply, um, next slide. All of the RFPs have their own websites that have example applications, that have the RFPs, that have all the forms needed for those applications. So really, we tried to try to make this a one-stop shop for all of your information that you could need for supporting materials um, for any of these RFPs and any of these applications. And finally, you can find our website by Googling the NCVW settlement. Um, and that's the link right there. And then we have to have the, and if you're not currently on our mailing list, we urge you, uh, you will get the most up-to-date information about the Volkswagen Settlement Program. If you send the word subscribe to the subject line of daq.nc underscore VW grants at ncdiener.gov. Um, and that will, you'll get all of the information that you could possibly need in a timely manner. And, um, and, uh, 
know when RFPs are closing and know when you get to need to get your applications in. We have a few more meetings of this uh, outreach program, which is the historically under-resourced county outreach program, because we want to get applications from some of these counties that we didn't get applications from in phase one. The next one that's coming up will be in Henderson on May 18th, and then we're going to head to Rocky Mount on that same day on May 18th. Like this uh, webinar, you do have to register and you can find that registration link um, on the web page here that is linked below. And I think we can open it up to questions. All right, before we start questions, just want to let everyone know a copy of this presentation will, is available on our website. Um, so you can get the, if you didn't get the links on there, you can get it from the website. And I'll put up the contact list. We had a quest to see that screen again. Okay. All right, Sean, you can be in question session. Yeah, I'll go through and read um, the Q&A that we have in the Q&A chat box so far uh, and give you guys a chance to answer some of these questions uh, for everyone who's on the call today. I'll just remind um, for the attendees that if you have any questions uh, that our staff can answer today, just type it into the Q&A box and uh, we will get to it. So the first question here came from Brandon Lomax um, he had a question. He is from the Boys and Girls Club from Davidson County. He didn't see that county highlighted. Uh, I think he met on the uh, Hercop map, um, and he wanted to know if that meant he couldn't apply for uh, funding. And if you want to answer that in a little bit more detail, but yes, VW grants are open to all 100 counties. Yeah, just to identify counties in the Hercot program receive bonus points. So that's the only difference. You can, but like Sean said, you can still apply. All right, thanks, Brian. Um, the next question was from Jeffrey uh, asking to share the email address to subscribe for updates again. Do, do you want to go back to that slide just in case anybody wanted to, to copy it down one more time? And we had a question from Melissa Williamson. When is the deadline to apply for the application if you're a local county government? Um, I saw Robin had responded to her, asked which program um, you were talking about. And let me scroll down here to be eligible to receive funding for charging stations. Um, so do you want to answer kind of when the programs close for? charging infrastructure RFPs. Sean, this is Robin. Can I add on to that real quick? Um, yeah. Melissa, Melissa's concerned that she's not going to be able to get into the grant management system um, in enough time to be able to apply for um, charging programs. And she wasn't specific about which charging programs, but um, I did mention that we have several open so if you guys could just speak to that, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I'll start. Uh, this is Steve with the uh, level two program. Um, in terms of uh, an end date on when you can no longer apply, um, hearing that you're a, a local uh, government, I believe it was, it wasn't a state agency, uh, any of the programs that you could apply for are first come first serve, which means the, there's no official end date on when one could apply. We are accepting applications until we run out of money to distribute in the program. Um, uh, the DC FAST program is different. You know, Dave can, can talk about that just in a second, but in terms of the level two program, uh, there's no end date. We still would encourage you to get into the grants management system as soon as possible if the level two program is what you're interested in uh, there is still funds available for the public access program um, down the road if you're thinking about workplace charging you know there's about half a million dollars that will be devoted to that um, but definitely if uh, you're considering level two still get into the gms as soon as possible okay so for dc fast the priority corridor um, really what it boils down to is getting into the grant management system. Um, that's pretty much outside of our control. Um, we do 
look at the access request to make sure they're valid, that the NCID format is good, that you have all the information needed to process that. And we forward it on to the security team, the, um, the EBS security team, which is the team that manages the um, grant management system. So once we do that, it's out, out of the hands of us here in DEQ. And I mean, just the, the truth of it is that it take, it's taking five to seven business days to process those requests. Um, and you can do the math um, and we basically are out of time or running out of time now. So if you don't have an access request in now, I would suggest you strongly suggest putting in that access request today and then hope that it is um, completed before the 16th. Um, so, I mean, you can't even, you can't make an application until you're in the grant management system. Right. And just you to clarify on that, um, the um, SAP team, they manage other organizations that use the system. So it's not just our people asking for our system is other people in other state agencies that also use the system. They had to process those requests as well. So there is no prioritization on which one they're going to do the first is just based on their queue as they come in as they're submitted by the agencies. We do have um, an online checklist and a sample application that you can start working on the pieces of your application. Um, that's, I mean, that's really the best thing I can I tell you is that you can, um, request your access um, and then start working on your application. Great, thank you. Um, the next question came from Jeffrey, who was asking if we were going to post these materials uh, after the webinar today. We just want to remind folks where they can get all of these slides and other resources. Uh, yes, if you Google um, Volkswagen Settlement, it'll pull up our main Volkswagen webpage. Let's see, I'll pull up here. And I did drop a short URL in the um, in the chat as an answer. All right. And if you scroll down, you can see all the open RFPs. They're available, and then additional information on in-person meetings, and then additional information on historical under on the resource county outreach program forms, and on grant management questions about a grant management system, which also includes a user manual, which I do encourage everyone to look through. It has um, some tutorials of how to submit attachments and everything like that for your application. So it's very helpful if you have questions, and if you don't still have additional questions, just ask your program manager. But um, what was that URL? Short URL. Robin. Um, I put it in as an Shit. answer to one of Jeff's questions. Okay. It is https right. colon slash slash deq dot nc dot gov backslash vw hyphen hurcop. Now there's another one we made for just program um, the phase two as well. It's https colon backslash backslash bit dot ly backslash three s q s s j nine. Okay. The next question uh, is just another request to go back to the email address. If you want to go back to that slide, Brian, while I uh, read the, the next question after this. Which slide was that? Uh, with the uh, email address to uh, subscribe to updates. Oops, sorry for scrolling. There it is. There. And then. We have a question. Um, from Jeffrey again, uh, hi, Dave, <laughs> my company is in the process of acquiring land along these corridors. 
would we have access to funds if we demonstrate ability to install DC fast chargers, but without land yet under control? So the overall answer to that for DC fast would be yes, you can apply. Um, there are some things that you do have to have in the process, which would be the GPS coordinates um, for your application. So you kind of need to know, um, yes, I'm buying this piece of property. Um, just like anything, um, you, the award letters can be declined. So if something goes wrong um, later on down the road, um, you can decline an award, but you can't apply for it after the dates. Once, once in, um, a submittal date has passed, you can't submit that application. Thanks, Dave. Richard asks, um, how does prioritizing rural counties help with emissions when their carbon emissions per capita is lower than urban centers that have not been deemed priority? Okay, the main goal of the Volkswagen settlement program was to mitigate the NOx emission from the diesel vehicles that were found um, in violation of the Clean Air Act. So, uh, every, almost every county had vehicles registered that were subject to that um, consent decree. So, this program is we're looking to have counties that traditionally have not applied for funding uh, in any of our programs to apply for funding because every county uh, should deserve some of this funding to replace older vehicles or install charging infrastructure. So that's the reason for us for creating this historically under-resourced county outreach program is to get the word out to these local officials that traditionally have not heard about these programs to let them know about these funding opportunities so they can apply for funding for replaced vehicles or install charging infrastructure. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Melissa asks if we can show the slide with the staff contact information again. And while that's up, the next question is from Scott. If we received funding in the first round diesel vehicle replacement, does that hurt our chances of funding in this round? Uh, no, it does not. Uh, as long as your project is in good standing or completed, uh, you should uh, you can apply for phase two funding. Um, so I, I do encourage you to apply. Again, do not wait to the last minute to apply. Um, uh, we did have some problems uh, at the end of the transit and shuttle bus program application. We had a few applicants that had issues um, accessing the system that had ac that had access but could not get to it. And we also had one uh, applicant that applied under the wrong program. So, um, without doing that early, we, if you do it early, we can identify those issues and get it back to you so you can apply before the deadline. Again, for the level two programs that are first come, first serve, it's best to get the access as soon as possible if you're planning to apply. Uh, don't wait because those funds could be exhausted by the time you get access and decide to submit an application. And, and Brian, well, oh, I was going to say, and, and I'd like to supplement what Brian just said. If at any point you have any questions, especially as to which program you want to apply to, because we do have several RFPs and programs and applications open right now, please don't hesitate to ask us. We do want you to apply under the correct program. So if you aren't sure, contact one of us and we will let you know. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, that was the last question that we have uh, sent to us in the Q&A box right now. Uh, I don't see um, anyone on phone raising their hand, so uh, that's. I'll let you know if another question pops up. All right. Uh, again, we appreciate everyone's time and joining us today. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to contact the program managers or myself. Um, all this information is on our website. Uh, a recording of this webinar will be made available on the website uh, shortly, probably a day or two from now. Um, and I believe you will also receive a thank you email for attending this webinar in the future.
Are there any more questions? Still no questions, Brian. All right. Let's see Robin type in something. And also the um, the link for the EPA presentation, the whole presentation was provided in the chat by, by Robin. So if you're interested in that, um, you can apply to that. And if you have any questions for Alan Powell about that program, you can send them to me and I can forward those questions to him directly for him to answer you um, directly from him. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, we'll give you some more time in your afternoon. We appreciate you attending this webinar. We hope to see your applications. Um, again, thank you for attending. Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon.